This is a finance panel. <laughs> Daryl Duffy, Bill Sharp, Marcus Brunemeyer, and Thorsten Hens is not able to join us for family reasons. All is well now. I spoke to him this morning, or did email this morning, and his daughter is home from the hospital. But her Sheffrin has graciously agreed to cover for Thorsten and to make some remarks on Arrow's thoughts regarding behavioral economics and finance. This is particularly important given today's Nobel. John Chauvin in introduction to Jim Mearley's as Ken's fifth Nobel Nobelist reminded me that I signed the papers that brought Thaler to the University of Chicago. I also signed the papers that brought Obama to the University of Chicago, <laughs> but I will make absolutely no claim for the strong performance that followed. Um, we've repeatedly heard that Kenneth gave us the framework and the tools. To quote, quote Al Roth, and I think it's the right quote in his opening remarks, his work, we work on the edifice that he created, and that's been amply noted. Social choice, where he defined the problem and proved the definitive result. General equilibrium, where with Gerard de Bru, can define the workhorse model of perfect competition and reconceived the welfare theorems in a way that John G. properly described was revolutionary. John G. is Giannikopoulos, you all know. It passes the aha test by any measure. The Arrow de Bru formulation of perfect competition is our workhorse model of competition. It is a powerful framework for understanding monopolistic elements, public goods, the distribution of income, and the rationale for government intervention. As we've heard, it also carries significant weight in macroeconomics, and it is central for finance. Finance enters the study of general equilibrium through the allocation of uncertain consumption. The key paper is Ken's The Role of Securities in the Optimal Allocation of Risk Bearing. One begins with the idea of states of the world and then contingent commodities. Arrow distinguished between a claim on a commodity, say a bushel of corn, if it rains or if it is dry. With a sleight of hand, the price of, for a bushel of corn contingent on it rains differs from the price of corn if it is dry. It is a trick, sort of similar to flipping a pencil. We, re we remember the sleeping during our talks, but we also remember the pencils. It's a deep trick which incorporates the manner in which economic actors shed the risk of holding only corn in a year when the harvest is bountiful. Insurance markets and futures contracts are integrated into the theory. Security markets follow, as do dynamic trading strategies, arbitrage, and the valuation of derivatives. Black shoals and rational expectations equilibrium. Information economics is not far away. Nobody has had more of an influence on our basic understanding of financial markets and health provision markets than Ken. And applications with trillions are at stake. It all fits together, the right conceptualizations and the tools that are essential for the most significant applications. It is not theory for theory's sake, as beautiful as those theories may be. It is deep understanding, understandings that have changed the world. But as Bob Lucas correctly reminded us, we do not know it all. And in economics, it is frequently a long way from the aha theory to the important applications, relevance. So now to the panelists and finance, and first, Daryl Duffy. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great honor to be here, a wonderful honor. Um, so echoing Hugo's remarks, Arrow's 
most important contribution to financial economics is surely his 1953 paper on the role of um, securities in the optimal allocation of risk bearing. And I'm sure we're going to continue to hear a lot about this paper on this panel um, because it's the genesis of modern uh, financial asset pricing theory. Now, I want to focus on the title idea of the paper, is, which is the role of securities in achieving uh, an efficient allocation of state contingent consumption. But this paper has a number of big ideas. Um, they're obviously interrelated. None of them require the depth of analysis that showed up, for example, that John described in his uh, work with Arrow, uh, with Debra on uh, the existence of general equilibrium. They're all very simple uh, tricks, I think Hugo uh, meant the word in that sense, that now seem obvious, natural, transparent, but at the time, in 1953, um, they were far from apparent. So, uh, among other big ideas, uh, this paper introduces two different ways to trade in markets so as to achieve state contingent consumption. And in fact, one of the big ideas itself is the idea of a market for state contingent consumption, which now seems obvious. It's the way that we teach asset pricing theory in essentially every doctoral program. But at the time, um, how uncertainty was incorporated into the theory of markets was far, or how it would be, was far from clear. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that idea of state contingent consumption, but before I do that, I want to mention that Arrow's paper with De Bruyne on the existence of general equilibrium uh, contrary to sometimes what, what sometimes hears, doesn't actually treat explicitly the case of state contingent consumption. It's specific to Arrow's 1953 paper. And uh, it's obviously, it only takes a couple of sentences uh, to add to the 1954 paper to get existence of equilibrium, but it wasn't in that paper. And in an interview of Arrow that I conducted for the American Finance Association on his contributions to finance, I asked him how it was that this, um, that this 1954 paper, which was actually drafted after his own 1953 paper on the role of securities and the optimal allocation of risk bearing, how the 1954 paper with De Bruyne happened not to make this observation. And I, I actually didn't get the bottom up, to the bottom of it, but it seemed to have to do with the fact that he and De Bruyne collaborated by postal mail while both of them were traveling. And uh, it was just hard to coordinate getting that observation into the paper, especially given that they were so, so intensely focused on proving, uh, getting this hard proof of existence of equilibrium. In that interview, I asked Arrow how he actually came up with this notion of markets for state contingent consumption, uh, given that the way that uncertainty had been captured in general equilibrium theory had been I think he used the term muddled. It wasn't actually, there was no specific notion of uh, market clearing uh, demands and supplies for uncertain consumption. And in response, he named a number of influences, uh, including uh, Bernoulli, von Neumann and Morgenstern, Irving Fisher, uh, Leonard Savage, or Jimmy Savage, which, to whom he gave a lot of credit, and Frank Knight. Um, but interestingly, uh, the the thing that triggered his imagination for creating this notion of state-by-state state consumption and having a market for that was the work of John Hicks in Value and Capital. Hicks had had the idea not of treating uncertainty, in fact, Arrow was, was somewhat um, critical of the clarity of Hicks's contribution on uncertainty in markets, but Arrow got the idea of Hicks's treatment of consumption over time a stream of consumption as a bundle of time-by-time -time consumption. And he took that idea um, and converted it into the idea of state-by-state -state consumption, which, as I said, now seems rather simple, but at the time, it was a breakthrough. Then I asked Arrow about his new model for financial security, another idea which is very obvious today, but at the time, 
There was no such notion in economic theory of a financial instrument which one trades and which pays one in units of account, like dollars, which one can then take and spend on consumption markets or goods and services markets. And when I asked him that question, here's how he answered I'm just going to quote him. Um, you can look at the video on the AFA's website. Well, he said, quote, well, I guess I knew enough about the world to know that securities usually didn't pay commodities. There were futures contracts, so there were some sets of markets where you actually delivered goods. But I knew that most securities did not. It struck me that this reduced the number of markets so there was an efficiency due to the fact that securities are paid in money which you can then translate, meaning translate the money into consumption. Then he said, it's a question of stating it. This is so arrow. It's a question of stating it. Anything you say there is obvious once stated. The problem is to state it. Uh, that's the end of that quote. Now, this idea of economizing on the use of markets by using the dynamic trading possibilities to span time and state contingent consumption is now the standard paradigm in my field, which is asset pricing theory, and also in industry practice. And it's been alluded to a couple of times today that this idea was eventually developed and redeveloped finally into the approach that Bob Merton used to prove the Black-Scholes option pricing formula, an alternative proof. And this is also the standard method that's used on Wall Street, as we say, but it's actually all over the world, for estimating the market values of derivative securities and for hedging them. That is, <laughs> Suppose one wants to create some future stream of state contingent consumption, which we would now call a stochastic process that sits in a very high dimensional space of all possible stochastic processes. Now, as John Genicopoulos uh, mentioned, it's not always possible to do this. The markets are incomplete and, and, and uh, in many cases you can't do it. Uh, but the power of retrading the same small set of securities over time gives you the opportunity to span a very high dimensional space of consumption processes or to hedge, significant, reduce a significant amount of risk if you're facing a consumption process that you need to hedge. Using only a small number of securities, one can in many cases work out what portfolio of these securities to start with and how to retrade these securities at each point in time so as to replicate that target consumption stream. And then, by arbitrage reasoning, essentially the same reasoning in Arrow's paper, the initial cost of this replicating portfolio must be the value of that target consumption stream. This idea was actually fully crystallized, in my view, here at Stanford in 1979 in a paper by David Kreps and Michael Harrison. But like many ideas in modern finance, it can be traced back to Arrow's 1953 paper. And this strikes me um, as somewhat analogous to the point that Amy Finkelstein mentioned with respect to his 1963 paper on healthcare, uh, which I just learned from listening to the last panel was a similarly seminal in that field. Thank you very much. No, you're not. Yeah, that's it, Torts. Um, I must tell you, um, when we first discussed this, uh, I was told two things. First, no slides. And I'm highly dependent upon graphs. Uh, so that was a bit of a shock. Um, and second, that we would be late in the day. And other panels were not supposed to exactly talk about our subject, but. John G. did a spectacular job. So I've been spending, oh, the other thing was, I thought, well, maybe I ought to write it out. So I did write it out, and I sent it to some of my co-panelists, 
in the hopes that I might establish property rights. Um, that was a dismal failure, I must tell you. Um, so I've been spending the day, well, no, I said that, and crossing things out. Um, and about all that's left is my own work. Um, but, <laughs> but, so, but I'm not going to I'm not going to inflict that. If I'm going to talk about it, but you'll be pleased to know I'll talk about it in a generally pejorative manner. So. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of, of minor things as I look back through the information. Um, you've heard about a pa the key paper, The Role of Securities and the Optimal Allocation of Risk Bearing. That was actually the title Ken used when it was published in 1964 in the Review of Economic Studies. The first publication was in 1953, and I, I want to read you what Mark Rubenstein, who wrote an annotated bibliography of the history of the theory of investments. This is in, 19, in 2001, or 2006, I'm sorry. Um, says, and I quote, Arrow 1953 may be the most important paper ever written for financial economics. And I would only quarrel with the use of the word may, um, or may be. Uh, it is really crucial, but as I'll try to show you, it didn't come into financial economics directly, and I'll try to spell that out. In any event, Ken's original title, and you really have to, I, my apologies to anybody who really knows French, but it was Le Rôle de Valeur Boursière pour la Repartition, doesn't it sound better? Pour la Repartition, le Merveilleux de Risque, doesn't that sound better? Everything sounds better in French. Um, and I asked Ken once, uh, did he present it in French? Uh, did he write it in French? And he said neither. Um, but it's almost all equations, so you can read it pretty well with or without knowing French. Um, and you've heard about it. Um, now, another sort of minimal point that I'd like to make. Um, some people call it arrow state preference theory, and you know why it's called state preference. There are states of the world, there are securities there for, and consumers have, and investors have preferences, and over states, over income, if you will, generically, or consumption in different states of the world. Um, I've always called it state preference theory, and I've always called it arrow de brew, uh, because as you've heard, Gerard de Brew was also working, uh, tilling similar fields. Um, so what should we call it? And I found a, a really moving and, and, and beautiful memorial that Ken wrote after Gerard de Brew died, and I'll quote from it. Uh, he described de Brew as his, quote, good friend and cherished collaborator with whom he joined forces to produce a theorem of the utmost rigor an abstract formulation. And he called it the Arrow de Brew model, so, so I'm, I'm exonerated. And he said, quote, though we had very similar approaches, the details varied considerably. On almost all points, we followed Girard's more elegant formulations. And again, that is so Ken, uh, being very, very uh, charitable and, and decent towards his co-authors. Um, as you know, he was awarded the prize with John Hicks, and I thought I was going to tell you that he was the youngest Nobel economist to this day. Um, I think, how old is Dick? Oh, he's got to be older he's, than he's older. 51. He's yeah, he's, he's up there. I, I knew him when I was a kid. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so, so you've heard all that. You know pretty much what state preference theory is. And now let me talk about how it came to financial economics. And I think I can say this with some accuracy because I was around through most of this time. In 1952, before Ken's first publication in this area, Harry Markowitz published an article called Portfolio Selection. And basically, Harry's approach was and is uh, mean variance assume that you can approximate an investor's utility function with a quadratic function at least over the relevant area, then it follows that an investor would be interested in the mean and the variance of a portfolio. So Harry built 
a normative theory, how should investors choose securities and how should they build portfolios. Then in the 1960s, now remember, state preference is out there. So in the 1960s, I and others turned that around as economists are wont to do and said, well, what if everybody did what Harry said? What would be the properties of an equilibrium in the capital markets? And that became known as the capital asset pricing model. And um, unbeknownst in some ways to us, what we were doing in that equilibrium was making an assumption about the relationship between prices and probabilities and overall consumption proxied by, say, the level of the market. So there was a connection to Ken's work, but most of us were sort of oblivious. I was introduced to it, I believe, by Mark or possibly by Jack Herschleifer at some point. But financial economics over in the business schools went happily on in a mean variance paradigm. Well, to the extent that economics departments were even thinking about uncertainty, they uh, adopted the state preference. So, um, what happened? Well, eventually, some of us began thinking, well, wait a minute, there's this other approach. A, how does it relate to ours? And B, which is the more fruitful? And to try to cut through a lot of, of detail, um, I like to think about it in terms of the marginal utility function of the representative investor, which is to say an artifact uh, for the market as a whole. Uh, before I do that, I want to also just talk about a doctoral area, area error, well, area and error uh, that, you know, bugs me, so I'll just share it with you. Um, in 1970, in a paper called Market Allocation Under Uncertainty, Jacques Drez, and I think you've heard his name here before, said, and I'm quoting this very carefully, while the prices for contingent claims, dot, 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 have all the properties of a probability measure, they are to be interpreted as the product of a probability by a relative marginal utility. Now, the first part of that says, hey, look, these things, if you normalize by the sum, sum to one, and they're all non-negative, so those are the properties of a probability. And somebody, and I don't know whom, and is to blame, thought, well, that's nifty. So people often talk about state prices in using the term risk due to a probability, which just bugs the hell out of me. Because A, people aren't risk neutral, and B, they're not probabilities, they're prices. On a more constructive level, I like to turn around the, the Drez statement uh, and think about the ratio of the price of a state to the probability, some consensus notion of probability of that state, what I like to call price per chance. And that allows you to think about the relationship between that ratio, relative marginal utilities, and Drez's terminology, and overall consumption, or in a simple world, the overall market return. <clears throat> and that relationship then becomes the marginal utility function of this representative investor. Now, back to the CAPM. In effect, the CAPM assumes that people have linear marginal utilities, quadratic utility, first derivative, and if everybody has one of those, then everybody collectively have such, or if you will, the representative investor. So in that diagram, which I'm not allowed to put on the screen, um, which has this price per chance or relative marginal utility on the vertical axis, and let's say the level of the return on the market as a proxy for consumption, um, you get in the CAPM a linear relationship, which at least at the extremes is implausible, and furthermore doesn't generalize very nicely, if at all, to a multi-period setting. 
Whereas if you allow a more sensible, and if somebody mentioned constant elasticity of substitution uh, this morning, if you use that for that particular curve, just because it's convenient and has at least plausible properties, uh, then you can get some very nice multi-period results. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I'm not saying empirically it is. Um, the key point, I think, is that with that kind of framework, you can look at and presumably estimate the cost of various kinds of payoff functions that relate to the market, but not in simple ways. Option pricing is, of course, as Daryl mentioned, a key aspect. And it turns out those things are everywhere. It turns out that I've been handed a note that says time, and rather than get the next one, and I'm not sure what it might say, uh, let me just stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Marcus. It's a deep honor to speak about the contributions of Canero and this gathering. I thanks a lot to the organizers for inviting me to do so. We admire economists who are deep economic thinkers and who can lift essentially things at a more abstract level and develop new frameworks uh, as they do so and focus on capture the essentials. I also admire economists who are very practical and do relevant research which change the world. And Canero was one who could combine both. He was building bridges across both. And he came already across in many other talks early on in many fields. And that's something which I deeply admire, to be able to bring these two elements together, doing very deep theory and on, on the one hand, and having the practical implications and applications always in his head, in his mind. So many things were already said in the panel, so it's uh, hard to... Uh, not to repeat some things, and I will try to avoid it. So let me focus on three aspects which I think are less mentioned so far, and then I will also try to connect it with some more recent research. The first thing I would like to mention is the Aeropred risk aversion measure, which was not mentioned so far. So he which shows essentially he was also trying to categorize various utility functions, so building on Bernoulli and the axiomization of expected utility from, from Neumann Morgenstern, he made an important contribution also in this field in order to classify various utility functions and how they behave as people become wealthier or less wealthier, whether they become more or less risk averse, and you know every but even undergrads know constant relative risk aversion in all the macro models and all the finance models. We use this as the first building block and we have a particular number to measure this uh, risk aversion of a particular person. And this also bridges, also builds a bridge to the mean variance analysis uh, Bill mentioned just before, where we now understand if you have quadratic utility function, then it coincides, or if you have exponential utility function, constant absolute risk aversion, and normal payoffs, then it also co coincides, and then you can actually build a bridge between state uh, consumption models and mean variance preference models where the CAPM was initially built on these uh, mean variance preferences. It also helps essentially to build newer models uh, in the behavioral research. So can you show that actually that everybody who is only, even if the payoff of the gamble is only slightly more than fair, so the expected payoff is only epsilon, slightly more than fair, and you're very risk averse, nevertheless, you're willing, everybody is willing to take a little bit of this gamble. And that's because when the utility is different, twice differentiable, uh, that's the feature. And this points already to some more recent research by Matt Rabin, some behavioral research, where he provides this small gamble critique. If you take this small gamble very seriously, then actually you will get a utility function which has to be very curved across uh, for big gambles as well. And that actually leads to some phenomena where people ha are increased, uh, very, very risk averse, more risk averse for, small gam for large gambles as compared with we observe. So there's this small gamble critique, and I think Ken's framework helps us to understand this, uh, to build a foundation for these additional insights we gathered uh, later than um, 
in his career by developed by others, uh, Matt Graben in this example. The, other, the second point I would like to mention is on insurance markets and risk taking. And of course, uh, with complete markets, we can separate the productive activities from the risk bearing activities. So both of these elements can be divorced. Uh, that's a very clean cut in these two things. So you can see that in most of Ken's model, there is essentially also real productivity, which is very much pointing to a macrofinance uh, perspective, not just uh, an endowment economy where you have real activity as well uh, going on. And he was always on the quest, as Daryl pointed out, given that if you have complete markets, you need so many, many markets, how to bring down the number of securities you need. One is to look at securities instead of contingent consumption. That's one way to bring the number of uh, markets down. The second one is to have use the securities over time as uncertainty unfolds, you essentially can trade and retrade these uh, securities over and over again, and this completes markets as well. But insurance and risk markets allow people to offload risk and hence permit, that's in Ken Ayer's words, permits individuals to engage in risky activities they would not otherwise undertake. That's in his uh, 1971 paper. And then the question is, what are these other activities? This can be socially valuable activities, like building a house, since one can ensure the risk of fire, for example, or doing research or doing learning by doing, which points to some other uh, work he has done, which uh, I think will be mentioned more later in these meetings. Or it can be socially undesirable activities, and moral hazard comes into mind, and we have heard already in the previous uh, section on health that you know, the moral hazard aspect plays a prominent role there, but it also plays a prominent role in finance. And he was just a small step away from identifying also in the endogenous feedback loops, because Essentially, systemic risk is a general equilibrium phenomenon. That's what he was all about. So for example, if you can ensure or diversify away idiosyncratic risk because markets are more complete, then people might take on more leverage and they might take on more leverage in aggregate risk dimensions. And this actually, in an incomplete market setting, might lead to more endogenous self-generated risk. So that's where the endogenous risk component is actually coming in. So you have more markets and you can sure better some idiosyncratic risk, but this actually leads to more risk taking and this actually then leads to more endogenous risk and makes the whole uh, system less stable. That's uh, something you know, he was pointing to uh, and showing that you know, how complex a setting could be if you have incomplete markets to make it less incomplete and actually then the whole risk buildup might be turning out more dramatic. And finally, uh, my third example, I just want to point to another area where he was actually you know, opening up many areas, but uh, one area which then has implications for finance is uh, real options in the context of environmental and resource economics. Uh, he essentially set up some real option theory and provided one very prominent example in the environmental dimension when investment is irreversible and it's valuable to wait with the investment because as uncertainty unfolds, you have better, uh, you can make a better decision as the uncertainty unfolds. And in this context, you can see that in finance, real option will play an important uh, phenomenon as well, and it has also implications uh, in this setting. So in sum, I would, I would like to mention again that he made unforgettable mark on the economics and the, and the finance profession. And I think what I mentioned in the beginning, that he was essentially building bridges on the one hand as a very abstract thinker, putting everything down to the essential, to the core, in understanding, lifting everything at the more abstract level, but on the other hand, always having real problems in mind and bridging these two things. I think that was something I think which makes him very, very special and very few people can do this at such an extent. He did it. Thanks a lot. Well, Doug Bernheim did a very beautiful job this morning with very, very little notice on speaking about the work of Richard Thaler. It really was a terrific job. Um, Hirsch Sheffrin has had similarly short notice. <laughs> And we're very grateful that he's um, going to say a few words about, about um, Arrow's work, including behavioral economics and finance.
Hugo, thanks for your kind words, and I must say I'm very honored to be here, even as Torsen's stand-in. Congratulations to Dick on his well-deserved Nobel. I'm just so happy for him. Later, if time permits, I'll say a little bit about his contributions to behavioral finance, but I'm here, of course, to talk about Ken's contributions to behavioral economics and finance. I'm very happy to uh, be able to stand in for Torsten and feel badly for him that he's not able to be here in person. Like all of us, Torsten was very heavily influenced by Ken and asked me to say that he really would have loved to participate in this tribute to Ken. Hugo asked me to speak about Ken's contribution to the development of behavioral and experimental finance. I will do so and draw on the comments that uh, Torsten had prepared for this tribute. So when it comes to Ken's contributions to the behavioral and experimental approach to finance and economics, Ken had a lot to say. Moreover, he was open-minded, dispensed sage advice, laid the groundwork for behavioral modeling, and was objective. I want to say something about each of these uh, four points in turn. Open-mindedness. So very early on, Ken did something that was unusual for neoclassical economists. He was open to the incorporation of psychological insights into economics, and in the 1960s, when he was working on learning by doing, he consulted his esteemed psychology faculty colleague, Jack Hilgard, about the psychology of learning. And then he discussed Hilgard's book in the published version of Learning by Doing. I was quite struck by that. Two, dispensing sage advice. So, Two decades after discussing these issues with Jack Hilgard, Amos Tversky joins the Stanford psychology faculty. And together with, uh, with Bob Wilson, who's here today, Ken and Amos hosted an incredible interdisciplinary seminar series here at Stanford. The seminar series provided Ken with a natural opportunity to dispense sage advice. I was fortunate to be a regular participant uh, at that seminar and occasional presenter. And the seminar served to identify fruitful directions for integrating psychological insights into economics and finance. As you all know, when Ken spoke, everyone listened. And Ken spoke about behavioral issues related to preference endogeneity, morality, happiness, and paternalism, concepts now very much in vogue in behavioral economics and finance. In behavioral finance, papers about socially responsible investing, impact investing, and the political economy of financial regulation reflect the issues that Ken emphasized. Three, groundwork. Ken's work on learning by doing, risk aversion that Marcus referred to, and general equilibrium that many have referred to, including Bill, laid the groundwork for the incorporation of psychological insights into finance and economics. His work on the Arrow Pratt measure is embodied in the formal structure of Kahneman and Tversky's prospect theory a theory which distinguishes between risk aversion on the one hand and loss aversion on the other hand. Prospect theory is based on experimental evidence. Productive experimentation requires learning by doing. Torsten Hens's current work combines learning by doing and risk profiling. And the same can be said for the approach at uh, Bill Sharp's firm, Financial Engines. You see, people really don't know what their gammas are, their coefficients of relative risk aversion. They need a voyage of self-discovery 
to get a sense of what that is. And that requires some sort of iterative experimentation. My own current work on behavioral pricing kernel theory owes a huge debt to Ken. And that approach could just as easily be called behavioral arrow de bras. Four, objectivity and constructive criticism. So Ken's objectivity led him to see the weaknesses as well as the strengths of the behavioral approach. He reminded us that testable hypotheses need to be refutable and criticized us for building theories that lacked predictive power. He did it ever so gently, but the message was clear. So in this regard, behavioral economists of all stripes are now learning those lessons by doing. And we can thank Ken for that constructive criticism. In the last decade, Ken spoke of, quote, his, his words, psychology invading economics. And he called for sociology to do the same. <laughs> so if the past is prologue, look for that to happen. When Ken spoke, people listened. His insights have momentum and his ideas will continue to impact the development of the behavioral approach for a long time to come. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Well done. You know, uh, we have time for a bit of discussion. It'd be nice to have some questions from the audience. But the two major panels on applied matters um, are on health economics and finance. And I will expect that the audience was struck by the discussion at the end of the health economics panel regarding the functioning of our health system. And I believe that a similar discussion may be in order for our financial panel. <laughs> How are we doing? Do financial economists help? What's the state of that? Can we speak of that openly in much the same way? that I heard the discussion after the health panel. I don't know who wants to chew on that. Some people have proprietary interests, I would expect. Well, I'll just you're, you're the natural guy. First of all, it's, <laughs> it's no longer my firm. I'm retired, um, <laughs> but, but I, I, I'm glad for the mention. Um, I, I think financial economists have contributed a few things. Um, index funds, came out of sort of notions of equilibrium, you know, whether you got them from a CAPM story or an Arrow de Bru story. Um, and uh, they've certainly become a, a major factor in, in the world of investing. And I think by and large, they have been a force for good, lowering the cost of, for ordinary human beings to, you know, save now so that they can consume later when their incomes cease. Uh, and so I think, uh, I think good has come out of financial economics. Um, we all think we know about terrible things that go on in the financial industry, um, and some of them really do. <laughs> but uh, I think our trying to bring some sort of discipline and sense of market clearing and equilibrium uh, to this very important and very complex and very complicated, unnecessarily perhaps, industry, I think has been, I, I like to think since I, I devoted my life to a field that didn't even exist when I started, um, of financial economics, which I differentiate from finance uh, as a whole, um, I think it's been net-net a plus. But I would say that, you knew that. <laughs> Daryl. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, I'm, I'm one of the financial economists that let, we collectively let uh, down a lot of people um, before the financial crisis by not doing what Arrow did and studying market failures and um, relying too heavily on the ability of markets uh, to work efficiently. Uh, there are so many sources of asymmetric information and moral hazard 
in financial markets that we probably should have been educating ourselves better about those failures and instead we were following the paradigms. Of course, Arrow set down some wonderful paradigms to follow rather than looking for um, where the problems might lie. Since that crisis, however, I think if you just um, think about what our doctoral students, some of whom are in this room, are now studying, the topic names vary, but I'd say macro finance, Marcus is one of the people that introduced that term, I think, is very popular among our doctoral students, and they're paying very close attention to financial institutions and the frictions associated um, with um, financial markets that would lead to financial instability or to mistreatment of financial consumers. I was one of the people, for example, that before it was established, didn't think the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau was a big add to, um, to our list of, a long list of regulatory agencies because it had, that, that responsibility already resided with other agencies and that this might be another bureaucracy. I was just wrong. I think um, Michael Barra, the Assistant Treasury Secretary, made a speech one night in Washington that just convinced me that um, this issue wasn't receiving enough priority, uh, market failures were occurring, and that uh, financial consumers were not um, being as well served as they could have been, and that um, agencies that are primarily charged with looking after the interests of financial consumers are a good idea, I mean, at least first order. So that's, that's my take on your question, Hugo. Good. Bill. Yeah, I just build on that a little bit. <clears throat> my interest at the moment is retirees and how they invest for their retirement. But I, I like to make the analogy of you go to your family doctor, and your family doctor is a financial advisor who presumably has taken Daryl's course and a few of the others. And so I think there may be something that, in that field at least, we, we finance people can learn by looking more carefully at Ken's uh, work in healthcare. <laughs> think about it. Marcus? Yeah, let me just, uh, I'm not sure whether I should play the Angus Deaton, what <laughs> Angus is in health and in, in, in playing in finance. So I think I agree with Angus in the sense that in terms of ethical standards and norms, I think that in finance there's even more money focus. I think that's something which I guess goes a little bit beyond uh, economics and finance, but I think that's something to work on. I think there's also many universities have started to emphasize this much more. Overall, I think finance is there to improve well-beings of human beings, and uh, that's essentially the, the main pur purpose of finance. But is there like in, in health, perhaps, or too much Medicare, which ruins health? Is there too much finance and which uh, ruins it? And it could be in certain dimensions there's too much finance. So it could be that there's too much trading going on. There is some, on the high-frequency domain and other domains, there can be some phenomena which uh, harmful for society or at least not beneficial and some parts of society can take advantage of the other parts. Overall I would say that's essentially the, the task of academics like us to figure out where the, the failures are. As Daryl said, there are market failures and that's what we have to figure out and then improve upon it. But just throwing the whole thing out I think is not the right thing to do, it's just trying to figure out where the loopholes are, where the problems are and then work on them and improve on them. Thank you, Hirsch. Does the behavioral perspective offer us something? I also see a, a hand going up, so for you first. So the, um, I want to just pick up on, on something that, uh, that Mark had just pointed out that had to do with excessive trading. So back in the early 1980s when behavioral finance was, was picking up, there were sort of two strands that, that, we, that we followed. One strand, this is a strand that uh, Dick and his uh, then student Werner de Bond picked up on, was to try and understand whether psychological forces lead markets to be less than fully efficient. And then the other strand that my uh, colleague Mayor Statman and I focused on was, well, let's suppose that markets are reasonably efficient. Do most investors act as if they believe that markets are efficient? And the degree of trading suggests that they most certainly do not. So the questions that, that we sort of pondered you know, have to do with the degree to which behavioral insights can help investors behave closer to the neoclassical framework than they do. And so what's been 
happening in, I'd say, the last uh, half dozen or so years is that financial advisors uh, are becoming more and more familiar with behavioral concepts that they now view themselves as managing their clients, not just their clients' wealth. And that means really uh, using tools to try and help advisors avoid some of the be behavioral biases. And then just coming back to, uh, to Dick's contributions uh, especially. So when it, when it, what Dick and I studied in, in the 1970s and 80s was you know, why self-control is such a critical factor for most people not saving enough for retirement. But what Dick took, did with that idea was to make it very practical with his then student Shlomo Benarzi, later colleague, by building this program, Save More Tomorrow, that used psychological insights about self-control and framing to actually help people save more. And in that sense, I think that the answer to the question is definitely important. I Thank agree. you very much. I think we have time for perhaps two more from the audience. Larry and Anat, and then we'll hold it to that. Why don't you use the, the mic? Oh, here's the microphone. Good. Let me uh, ask the panel to react to a question that was first put to me by Jeremy Bulow 35 years ago and that has gotten uh, more attention in the last... Uh, in the last uh, couple of years that connect some dispersed strands of Kenneth's work. I think we go something like this. Um, if you're the dean of Stanford Law School, you're supposed to work for Stanford Law School. If you're the president of Stanford University, you're supposed to figure out what's best for Stanford University as a whole. If you're the president of GM, you're supposed to do what's best for Buick and Chevrolet together, not what's best uh, for one of them. If you, if we live in a world where everybody understands the theorems, then everybody's going to buy an index fund. And so the shareholders of GM are going to be the same as the shareholders of Ford, are going to be the same as the shareholders of uh, Chrysler. And so the managements really ought to work for the collective interests of all the companies rather than against each other. So there are people who have claimed, I think, rather, implausi rather implausibly that currently there's lots of collusion induced by index funds. I find that to be a kind of implausible uh, conclusion about what's happening in the world, literally. But it does seem to me that there's a fairly broad and fundamental question raised by Ken's views about unanimous shareholders who all should be able to agree versus the views of modern financial economics about everyone should diversify. And so if the world ever got taken to this limit, it does seem to me that it would raise some rather deep issues. And I'd be interested in the panel's well, view on pardon, those deep pardon, issues. Pardon my lack of voice. I'd like to ask one person to answer this who's really hot to answer it, and then I'm going to turn to a not for the last intervention. Marcus has, Marcus Marcus, has a student. Marcus, go for Marcus it. Marcus has a student that worked on this problem. <laughs> go ahead, Marcus. Yeah, I might be biased because my student essentially is pushing this line of research. Um, I think in the limit it is a problem. I don't know to what extent it is at the moment. Uh, uh, but of course, the common ownership, if you take a simple theoretical model, then you would say that would be quite natural coming out of this simple theoretical model. If everybody is just owning all the shares, all the companies, then they will collude. Uh, on the other hand, I don't see the mechanism how it would work with the current corporate governance, that how it will work through the boards and the, so through the selection of the CEO and, and then putting some pressure on that. My student essentially, he did some studies, he has some empirical analysis he, and there's some indication at least it's going this way. The fact that the labor share is going down, the fact that market power is going up points in the same direction as well. But of course, at this stage, I think it's still not conclusive. We have to do more research to, to figure this out. But I. I wouldn't rule it out in the limit. I would not 
be not 100% convinced it's already going on at the moment. It's good we're tur turning to the work of our students. I like that. <laughs> Einat, for the final question or point. Just talk? Okay. Yes. It works. Sorry. Uh, I wanted to bring up one thing that uh, I actually read in, in Ken's uh, last book that people may not be aware of. It actually has some transcript of these, his, his history, historic, uh, oral history that he talked about, and that's a book about ethics. And in that book, uh, there's a lot about his life and his development that was fascinating. But he also talks a little bit about finance, just, uh, um, and, and one of the things that he says is that um, he thought, for example, that credit default swaps, more securities are not helping, and that they, they shouldn't be even legal uh, because there's no insurable interest, et cetera, et cetera. So he, I think, uh, I've had a number of discussions with him in the last decade where he seemed to have realized that there are, are certain frictions, and I think it's not the moral hazard that was referred to here necessarily, but it is more of the sort that Angus was talking about, which is uh, that there are huge inefficiencies because of information and power differentials uh, between some people and, uh, and the rest of the people. And so it's an inefficient industry quite uh, in some different uh, forces, but parallel to, to healthcare industry, both of these being pervasive, subject to pervasive market failures. I'd like a little bit of acknowledgement of, of, of that problem, which see enormous amount of fraud, deception, and endangerment in financial markets, and uh, different issues in healthcare, but I think both these industries uh, do require non-market uh, interventions. Point well made. A hand for the panel, a hand for the organizers, a hand for Kenneth.